Rafaelo. I heal back with my brother. How you doing? Ah, uh, this uh, she bought for now. Nothing bad. We are surviving. Oh, oh God, Matt. Hello, everyone. Hello. So my assumption is that. Uh, we are all here, is that right? We are missing, let's see here. I, I'm uh, thinking Abimbola, I can see Abimbola in um, the general attendee oh. side of things. And I think Okechuku is also there. So yeah. probably oh, yeah. to let them know they could use their panelist uh, link instead. Yes, I have to, how can we inform them that uh, I believe they can hear. <laughs> okay, they can hear us. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. How do I show my hand? Uh, let me show my hand. You can also chat to them up, really. Just sending a message. To oh, the yeah. She's, yeah, I think, let me see. Okay, just... Uh... My colleague at KU Stacey sent an email earlier. Prof, you saw that, right? Yes, I, I did see that. Yeah. She said she couldn't make it and she sent her apologies. Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw that. Okay. Uh, seems like this should. Uh... They should, they should see our chat and our response. Let's see. Sabine Bala is asking a question here. Yeah, so she, she's, she's still in the other room, right? The other session. Let's see how we can bring her here. Well, uh, Professor Adela Kuhn and um, Dr. Wafwa, if you guys can hear us, Please use the customized link, your personal link. That's what will get you to us. That will bring you right to this uh, Zoom room. I think you can let us in. Okay, let's see that. Oh, interesting. Okay, let me see. How do you do that, participants? Sorry, you, this Zoom thing sometimes confounds me, but let me see if I can, I can figure this out. Um, Hmm. It's asking me to invite. I don't think that's right. No, that is not right. Uh, I could send them my personalized link, but to me having multiple gems on the screen. Hmm. I think you, if that works, perhaps you just change the names. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> uh. Okay. Let's see. Let's stop in Bola. Dr. Mwafo, okay, you use your personal link. He, he said he used his personal link. So are you are you here in this room with us then? If that's the case, you should be here. Let me see. We see, we can't hear him. No, it's not working for some reason. Um, I'll be able to promote them to panelists by right clicking on their names. Okay. I can't even see their names, but... Uh, Brother James, can you see their names? 
if you can right click on their names, it should be possible. You see their name and the right click option is just to chat. It's a chat, okay. Uh, okay. Well, this is weird. Yeah, I think only the host can do that, that yeah. which maybe not, whoever is LSA conference session B might be able to help us. Right, that, and that's not me, so yeah. I'm not the host technically. Yeah. So that would be either Saeed or one of his people, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Um. Okay. Got it. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. Got it. Sorry. I'm very sorry. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> no problem. The Pentecostal <laughs> powers have let you in. By yeah. fire, by force. <laughs> All right. Thank so you. now we now have to drag our brother. Uh, okay, well, for today, to he's here. Week. He's here he's already. Here. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. We're all here. Great. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. can hear you. Hello, Excellent. okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are, and uh, welcome. To yeah, good evening. Session. Welcome to this session on um first book publication. So we have a distinguished uh, panel of um, first book authors with us this evening. And hopefully we can uh, generate you know, enough uh, conversation around the challenges and also the thrills of publishing the first book. The first book is uh, for every scholar the most exciting because you know prior to that you had never published uh, a solo book. So um, please, I'm not trying to quit this that experience with uh, being, being being pregnant at all because uh, you know it's not even close. But uh, if there's anything uh, you know, similar to it, that excitement, it should be maybe that, that kind of expectation. So that's the first book that uh, does that to you. You are full of excitement, but it's also challenging in multiple ways. So hopefully we can do justice to the process in the hope that prospective first book, uh, pop, uh, first book authors can learn from your experiences. All right, so let's do the introduction. Um, I'll introduce, I'll be brief. So uh, first, uh, among the discussants in the, on the panel, we have uh, Dr. Abimbola Adela Kun, who is an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Her book, her recently published book is titled Performing Power in Nigeria. I'm only reading the short title. Um, and it was published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, second on the list of panelists is uh, Dr. Chibo Anya Duba, who comes to us from the University of Winnipeg in Canada. He is the author of the post-colonial African genocide novel, which was published by Liverpool University Press. Next on the list is Matthew Brown, who is at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and who is the author of Indirect Subjects, published by Duke University Press. Uh, okay, so ho hold on, is that, is that right? No, I think, I think something is wrong, but I don't think that's the title. Hold on, yeah, I got the wrong title here. Uh, right, okay, let me read it. Yeah, I think I, the, the, the way the title was written in the LSA program is it, it's a bit wrong. So Matthew Brown, this, the title is Indirect Subjects, Nollywood's Local Address. Okay, so got that right. The next person is Dr. Okechukunwafo, uh, who teaches at uh, the Nnamdi Azikiwe University in Oka, and who is the author of Ashwebi, published by Michigan University Press. 
Um, and Stacy van der Horst could not be with us uh, today because he sent an earlier email uh, regretting his uh, absence. I think he had some problem with his flight. And that doesn't surprise me because I've been, you know, seeing that in the news lately. So we wish him the best. Um, and uh, the last person on the panel that I'm going to introduce is James, uh, Dr. James Yeku, who teaches at the University of Kansas in the United States. And he is the author of Cultural Netizenship. I want to say it right, Cultural Netizenship, published by Indiana University Press. Okay. So uh, I think the format is pretty simple from my understanding. I, as the chair, I just simply I have a list of questions that I've written out. But at the same time, I, I want to reserve a lot of time for audience uh, questions and comments, because I want it to be as interactive as possible. This seems like one of those panels where people can really learn the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts of uh, how to do the first book and how to go through the various stages. So I want to give a lot of uh, opportunity to will be first time authors to ask questions and seek clarifications. So let me, let me um, is that okay? Is that a good format? Uh, let me, that's a good format? Okay, all right. So let's get into the question out there. Yes. Yeah. I'll ask the questions to each panelist. We'll, we'll go around and then I'll, go, I'll move to the next question. And hopefully we'll just we'll round that up and we'll have enough time for audience participation. The first question I have here is, um, what was your most challenging uh, part of uh, doing this book, preparing this book manuscript? What was the most challenging experience for you revising, I'm assuming, uh, a dissertation into a book manuscript? And also what was the most rewarding? What was the most rewarding part of the experience? What was the most challenging about what, what was the most rewarding for you? Uh, let us start from, um, I don't know how you appear on the screen, but let's start from um, Dr. Adelakun, if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Prof. And good evening to all panelists, wherever you are. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you very much for your question. I will say perhaps the most challenging part for me was trying to move um, my dissertation to a book and trying to figure out where it would fit in into the larger scheme of things. It was, um, it was a dissertation that was interdisciplinary and I was dealing with aspects that people had not really you know, done before, connecting performance as uh, Pentecostalism as performance, people studies as political science, anthropology, history, and aspect like that, and religious studies. And so trying to convince um, publishers that this has some merit that they need to look at, because the first question is, where does this fit in? And it was really challenging because I, you know, I had a list of possible publishers I would like to work with, and, you know, they look at it and say, well, it sounds okay, but this doesn't quite fit into the character of our series. And so you are dealing with, should I go to religious studies or should I go to performance studies or which one exactly, you know, should, where, where exactly do I go? And so there's the, the, some of the rejections that I uh, faced had to do with which exactly, you know, does it speak to? And also trying to revise according to the ones that will accept it, you know. And so when I finally found if, um, an editor that was interested, it was also now to begin to rewrite, you know, to fit into the character of their book series, which was really challenging because it had to come with a lot of reworking. But all of that passed. And I think the most rewarding part of it came when the, um, the reviewer's report came. And then I looked through it and they were, the reviewers were really excited. And for me, that was the best part because it meant that all the um, tension, all the stress, all the uncertainties that I'd experienced was eventually worth it. 
Thank you. Uh, excellent. And your response actually takes us into a little bit into the, my next question. So, but uh, I think Dr. Adilakun has set the ball rolling in terms of, you know, the challenges, but also, you know, uh, the pitch and so on and so forth. So feel free to speak broadly across all of these territories. Uh, Dr. Nwafo, please. Same question. I can repeat the question if you want me to. Sure. Yeah, I, I I understand I understand uh, the question. Um, thank okay. you so much for that uh, question. Um, first of all, um, I have to say that um, what was most challenging for me was actually trying to figure out how to write a book because I've never written a book before and I just wrote a dissertation. And then, um, how do I build an archive? for Ashebi dress and fashion, which uh, literally does not have anything written on it before I started working on my book. So um, it was a big challenge because um, all the texts that, um, scholarly texts that I tried to flip through didn't um, write anything on Ashebi. They just mentioned Ashebi in passing. And um, I kept wondering, how do I write a book on something and nothing has, uh, literally nothing has actually been written on. And it was a, a very big challenge. And again, trying to also um, figure out um, where to place Ashebi in the larger scholarship. Because um, what I was dealing with majorly was um, the concept of visual culture, um, urban cosmopolitanism, uh, dress, uh, fashion. So how do I um, bring all these things together? And what kind of book do I really want, want to write? So this is something that was very um, asking for me to pitch all these different disparate um, aspects of um, my scholarship together to be able to make a, a coherent argument. So uh, first of all, I, I, I grappled with that, but um, in the end, something, it, it came out quite fruit, fruitful. So the most rewarding aspect of um, my book was um, eventually when I discovered that this is actually a very interesting area of research, which is going to make a, a, novel, um, a novel scholarship and that I am literally going to build an archive for Ashebi. And also um, understanding that I can actually build uh, an archive for Ashebi from colonial history, even without being a historian. So it was something that was very uh, rewarding for me, um, if I may stop uh, at that. Thank you. All right. Well, I mean, I think we're seeing, we're seeing a particular trade develop uh, in these responses. You know, the question of uh, fit, the question of uh, how you frame, you know, the manuscript, the question of, you know, wh which series, you know, to, uh, to pitch it to and so on. So hopefully uh, that continues. Dr. Anya Dubba, please. Same question. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Moses, for... Um question and, and for the introduction and it's very wonderful to see all of you guys in camera here um yeah and i hope beyond this that we can have uh, more stuff to do together because i mean it's a privilege to <laughs> be in conversation with with all of you um I, I, and I, I think a lot of my own experiences resonate with the points um abimbola and Ukechuk already made um, but, but I think one of the most challenging aspects of this actually deciding first why I had to publish a book or write a book. <laughs> and as someone who uh, I don't like publishing actually, because, um, or rather I'm very hesitant to throw things out in terms of publication. And I feel, but why do I need to publish? Why do I need people to hear this, you know, why, why does it matter in that sense for people to read an article that I've written um, or read a book <laughs> for that matter, right? So, so getting beyond that point of 
asking myself why I have to write a book, I think was one of the most challenging. And the moment I was able to answer that question, uh, at least ideologically and pragmatically, I think um, I was able to convince myself that I could turn the dissertation into a book. Um, and one way I answered that question was first, well, you need the book for promotion. So that's <laughs> pragmatic aspect of things. Um, but ideologically, I, I think for me, I was trying to create um, what a structure of reference, and, and that's Edward Said's uh, phrase, you know, a kind of reference that I could uh, go back to and say, okay, this is what I've done even if it's not perfect and all that it's a kind of structure from where i could then begin to build intellectually on future projects and get myself to think outside of um, a prison that i already walked myself into during my phd dissertation research so yeah that that was that was it and and, and the rewarding and part of the experience for me was um was the debate actually, you know, the, especially one of my reviewers who wanted me to change um, the direction of the work and make it into a response to the white scholar actually. And I refused, you know, so the back and forth I think um, was rewarding and, and the press having to reason with me along, um, along the way. Yeah, so I, I like arguments, even if they don't lead anywhere. So that that helped in terms of understanding the fact that um, people are grappling with um, some of the things I didn't know whether they were actually sensible at all. Well, thank you, Dr. Anyadubwa. Uh, Dr. Brown, please, same question. The challenges and the uh, rewards of this, uh, this process. Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, thank you, and uh, I'll also say it's a great honor to be here with all of you, and a great honor to participate in the LSA's, you know, um, dedication to developing scholars, developing new scholars, junior scholars, younger scholars, etc. I just think this is great, and I'm so glad that we can, you know, we can do this kind of work together. Um, I'll echo some things that have been said um, about framing uh, the book for a particular audience. I mean, that's to me, that's perhaps the biggest difference between a dissertation and a book is to, a dissertation is written for a committee, a book is written for a larger audience. And so when you begin to think about what that audience is going to be, in my own case, um, and this may you know, resonate with some and not with others, you know, I came from a um, department where I was doing my PhD, where all of the faculty were, you know, Africanists focused uh, on African studies. Um, so I wasn't like in an English department where I had different kinds of faculty or history department where faculty focused on different things. And maybe um, those of you doing dissertations, you know, on the African continent will have, uh, you know, faculty, uh, you know, who are all focused on the same things, maybe or maybe not, depending on your department. Um, and then I got hired into a department, the same department, also very much focused on African studies. Um, so um, I felt like I had had a lot of preparation to speak to a particular kind of audience. And I wanted to challenge myself to speak to a wider audience. Um, so as I pitched my book to different publishers and ultimately when I was um, speaking with the editor at Duke, you know, the questions were, what would scholars of media and you know, global political economy who don't know anything about Africa, who don't know anything about Nigeria, you know, what would they take away from your study of Nollywood? Um, and I had already been kind of thinking along those lines. So the, the big challenge for me, um, but it was, it's the same thing was also the most rewarding for me was that I took my archive, you know, I, I took the structure of my dissertation, um, you know, and I locked it in my mind. And then I began with a blank page and I just wrote again. I wrote a new, I wrote a, an entirely new, you know, manuscript um, thinking about how I could bring different kinds of audiences into the discussion that I wanted to have. So that was a huge challenge to do that. And I'm not sure I succeeded. I think there are many ways that um, I fail to kind of speak to that audience in some ways that I fall back on the people who know Nigeria, who know Nollywood, and I speak to them almost directly. Um, 
but uh, so, you know, so the challenge, I'm not sure I even completely rose to the challenge, um, but that was also rewarding in many ways to try and conceptualize things in a way that might be, might provide what my editor called um, portable concepts, you know, that scholars from a wide range of disciplines might, you know, find useful for their own work. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. James, you please, same question to you. Uh, thanks, Professor Chono. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief and just say, in my own case, it was a question of the medium, working with social media and basically keeping up with the Joneses here, keeping up with a polity and a medium that is constantly changing. I thought that was quite challenging, especially just given the, the sheer enormity of materials to work with. I started tracking hashtags and selfies and cultural productions entangled with different protest movement from Occupy Nigeria to Hensas, everything in between. And it was just crazy trying to have a book that responds to all of those. I, I, I think that was a big deal. And it, what was produced eventually tried to do some justice to that. I tried my best to cover as many hashtags as possible as many things as possible. If you know social media, you know that that is also practically impossible at the same time. The second thing about the medium is probably the idea that everybody knows about social media. Everybody uses Facebook, everybody uses Twitter. So what exactly are you trying to say? How do you theorize a platform, a medium that is popular? That for me is what I mean, was quite challenging. In, in, in terms of what was a reward, I would say the reward for me was processual. It was in the process, like I think Dr. Anya Duba was trying to get at. Just thinking about the process of, you know, exchanges with peer, with, 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 with peer reviewers or the, 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 those who read the manuscript. I remember getting uh, a, a rejection from a press after two readers had read the work. One thought it was a fantastic project and the other one said, no, there's no empirical, anthropological, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, so why would you guys as a press choose to go with the moth, I mean, with the negative report because this person was a senior scholar. Anyway, I moved on to the second press and I think the kindness of whoever read, oh, well, I know the person now, the reader then, I didn't know the person then, but the kindness of the, of the, initial reader at the press where the book was rejected was what sustained that project. I almost gave up on it because this other press was insistent on going with a negative reviewer. The kindness of the other person was just something I found really inspiring. And, and for me, it, it made me pay attention to the other two reports later at Indiana. And just thinking about what it means to read another person's work and be gracious, what it means to be in a scholarly community and be kind to others. For me, learning to do that, learning that from other people was, was quite a reward. Well, this, this are, these are fantastic uh, responses. And I think uh, uh, for people who are here with us, I mean, I think this, these responses speak to the human and emotional side of this, uh, this process. You know, there, there's the technical side, which is, very academic, uh, esoteric stuff. But then, you know, there's the real human side of it. You know, you get, uh, you try to pitch it to this press and maybe you don't get the response that you expect or it gets sent out to reviewers and one or both of the reviews or all three of them in some cases uh, are asking you to do this and that. And you feel like, you know, this is too much. You know, this, I thought this, this work was done, <laughs> you know, uh, how can I summon the emotional energy to go back and make all these changes. So there's that, that human aspect as well. And, and I'm glad that all of you uh, in various ways spoke to it. But um, so, but I, I wanted us to, let me, let me make this announcement before I continue. The chat is now open. The chat is open. If you have a comment or question, please put it in the chat. I, I'm checking it. If, yeah, if you're in the audience, please put your questions in the chat or comments, please. Thank you. Um, so, so let's get down to the very practical side of this, uh, uh, this, this business now of just preparing this book manuscript and trying to find a publisher, right? Some of you have touched on it a little bit already, but this, you know, 
how was your experience? That's the question. How was your experience finding a publisher? And when you found one, how was your experience working with them? It's a simple question. So again, we'll go in the order that we went earlier. We'll start with uh, Dr. Adelako. Thank you very much, Fok. Um, I think for me, I, I took the process as partly as a, you know, the way you send out multiple job applications. So I sent out several manuscript um, proposals at the same time. And um, I, got, I got a call from a professor, a senior scholar that I respect a lot. And he said two <laughs> different publishers have sent your proposals to me that is a bad sign you know i had no idea that it was not it's not something they consider favorably right they didn't ask me are you talking to someone else so i took it that you could do that mm -hmm. and he said you know once you start to send to too many publishers you could actually discourage uh, people and they might think that you are not serious that you're just throwing things to the wind hoping you know something catches and so you should be careful about that and I've had conflicting advice in that respect. Should you send it to multiple publishers or do you wait? But I think I learned something very important from how he took me through that. Like sometimes just be very direct, target people. Don't you know be all over the place. Target people, target series and go directly to them and wait, give them like a month or two before you move on. But at that time, I just thought it was easier, you know, to write a general proposal and you know, talk to me also about the problems of writing a proposal that is too general that you would have problems with that. So there is um, that aspect about finding a publisher. And also I remember at some point I was getting rejected and I was getting a lot of silences too. And when my, the chair of my department, when I spoke to her about, you know, the challenges I was facing, she said, one of the things that can help you is that if you know a person in your field, who has published with a book series, ask them to reintroduce you to the editor. That it can be very helpful because editors get a lot of proposals. It's very easy to fall into a black hole of endless emails that they get. But if you get an introduction, it could help you. And so putting all of those things together helped me in the sense that I was able to you know, send out pro um, my proposals in more focused ways. And eventually, when I found one, it involved some, you know, moving around, reworking a lot of concepts, but I, I had to reshape a key part of the project to fit into the character of the series. But I had already scaled so many points, and also the fact that they were going to take my work, made it all, you know, worth doing eventually. Now I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Adelakun. Dr. Nwafa, please. Same questions to you. Um, okay, um, thank you so much. Um, first of all, um, I have to say that um, um, I am coming from a very uh, different uh, background. You see, um, all my academic um, itineraries um, were in Africa. And I don't really understand how um, to go about this uh, sending um, proposals to uh, university presses, and it was quite strange for me um, as someone who resides um, in Africa. So uh, the first thing I did was I browsed through the internet and I saw Indiana University Press, and I had revised my manuscript just once, and I sent it to Indiana University Press. And you know what? Um, just in less than a few days, I got a reply. I said, oh, unfortunately, we cannot, um, um, your, your manuscript is still very much in the dissertation stage. Um, you should go back and uh, rework it and then send it back. And that, that was how um, I got discouraged, um, demoralized, and um, I didn't send my manuscript out again for many years. And I literally dumped my manuscript. And um, I happened to travel to South Africa once and I met uh, my, my PhD supervisor. And she said to me, 
Okay, what is wrong? What is happening to your book? It's been long. And I said, um, I, I got discouraged when I, I, I got re a rejection from Indiana. And fortunately for me, I enrolled into manuscript development workshop organized by AHP. I was accepted and it, I, I traveled to Ebri in Ghana and um, Sandra Benz was my mentor and we walked through my manuscript and eventually um, Sandra Baines called me and said, okay, I think your manuscript is good to go. You can send your manuscript out. I said, wow, if she can um, say this, it means that my manuscript is really in, in, in a good shape. And um, I, also, I traveled to the University of Michigan for a postdoc and that, that was where I got um, the, the acquisition editors. I sent my proposal to them and they looked at it and said, oh, this, this has a prospect. Um, you can send your, your, your manuscript, let's look at it. And that was, that, was, that was it all. But I have to say that um, it wasn't easy in the first place because the confidence uh, most um, first book authors lack, you know, confidence because they always believe that uh, what they've done, you know, is not something that is worth looking at by any um, press. But I, I want to say this today that every first uh, book author must be very confident. Um, just believe that whatever you have done is good. It, 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 may, it depends on the perspective um, a, a, a press is looking at it and how you are able to network and, and get your manuscript accepted. So that, that's basically you know, what I have to say for now, but let me leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we go on, I, I just want to say that uh, I, I just saw uh, Dr. Nwafo's chat, I saw a message he sent to me. And I knew this information, but I didn't want to break confidence by revealing it when I was introducing him. So you have to respect you know, those types of, I didn't know if it was okay with me revealing it. So he has given me permission to share. So uh, starting this fall, uh, you know, I introduced him as uh, coming to us from uh, Namde Azikiwe University, Oka. But starting in the fall, he, he will be joining Wesleyan uh, University in Connecticut, correct? The United States. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm glad you gave me permission to share. I didn't want to. Uh, so, so congratulations on that move. <laughs> Thank you so much, Moses. <laughs> so, so Dr. Anya Duba, please. Same question. Congrats, Suki. Um, many yeah, congrats. Thank you. You are joining us here. You know, it's a loss to <laughs> it's, it's the way of the world, right? Um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, for, for me, it's it, it's a bit similar, um, but again, slightly challenging. So, I think in 2018, when I uh, finished uh, my PhD and defended and all that. I had this postdoc, not postdoctorate, a fellowship, research fellowship at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. So we had all these workshops for um, converting dissertations into books and all that. And one of the um, facilitators of the workshop um, was a very helpful um, person sharing contacts of editors and, and all that, and even um, recommending my work to a couple of, of those editors. I reached out to about two of them. Um, it turned out that they were looking for something slightly different. They wanted something that responds directly to the Holocaust. And they wanted me to change my um, approach and the way I was structuring the work to be a direct response to um, Holocaust literatures and all that. So I didn't want to do that, <laughs> so I had to move. Um, but around the same time, early in 2019, I um, Liverpool University Press editor contacted me to review a manuscript for them. And these guys are crazy because 
every two or three weeks, they were chasing me around with emails. Are you reading the manuscripts? <laughs> are you, how far have you gone? No pressures just to remind you, we know you are very busy and all that, right? So I like the way they were working and how um, they were very conscious of time. They just wanted you to do the work and they moved very fast. So that inspired me to do a prospectus and, and send to them much later on. Um, but I had two major publishers, uh, presses in mind. Um, both of them accepted Liverpool University Press and Rodgers. Um, but Liverpool, again, was very fast. I had signed a contract with them when Rodgers wrote back. Um, Rodgers, I think I wanted to work with them because they were directly doing a series on genocide. So um, I thought I would benefit from that experience also working with the editors, some of whom are, um, I know to be serious genocide scholars. So, yeah, but I couldn't. I already signed a contract elsewhere. They came back like four months after I had signed the contract. <laughs> and I felt I wanted um, to work quickly with, if I leave a work for too long, I think like, okay, I will just lose interest in it. <laughs> and I don't move on or maybe publish the individual chapters as articles. So, so I needed to work faster just to leave the work behind and get onto something else. And that was um, one of the drivers for me for choosing Liverpool University Press. But they were also very fantastic in terms of the engagement. They were um, constantly following up. And um, yeah, so I, I think that was, that was essentially, I was fortunate essentially because <laughs> I had that thing. I didn't know about Liverpool University Press, which was never in my horizon in terms of consideration. I was looking at um, university presses in Canada and um, the US. Um, yeah, and then they sent me that manuscript and I felt, oh, I wasn't considering Europe at all. So, so that, was, that was the thing. The Canadian ones, uh, many of them were selective. They needed uh, funding from the government. So um, if you were in Canadian or permanent resident, they might not get funding from the government. So that informed a lot of their decisions. So when I talked to one of the editors and they were asking for my status, I knew I wasn't ready to wait for them <laughs> to, to get the work done. So I had to um, move immediately. I, I, I got that uh, thing from Liverpool University Press. You, you know what? Many of us can relate to that experience because as a first book author, you jump at the first yes that you get, you, you, you jump at it and you grasp it because you don't think you're going to get another yes. And then sometimes you get another yes down the road and you say, well, maybe I should have waited. But when you are you know, anxious about this process, you, you don't have the luxury of waiting. So we can relate to that. Uh, Dr. Brown, please. Same questions. Yes. Um... You know, one thing I learned along the way is that different editors have very different preferences for how they like to work. Um, so, I, you know, I um, talked to editors at different presses and I prepared uh, proposals for different presses. Um, one thing I can say is that, you know, in the pre-pandemic era, there was a certain, there's a certain kind of, um, you know, privilege and power that comes with being based in like North America, being able to attend certain conferences where publishers come, you know, they're selling their, their books, but the editors are also there and they're willing to meet with prospective authors. Um, but I took advantage of those venues. Um, now, you know, they're doing more of this online. And in fact, it's great that we've had many publishers who have attended um, LSA and who've been speaking to um, the audience here, you know, so whatever way um, a prospective author, you know, can, can find to actually speak with editors to try and make connections, I think helps a lot because I found some that said, you know, I, I need a good, strong proposal. These are our guidelines. This is our format. Please tailor everything to it and mm -hmm. submit it. And then it will go through our proper channels. Um, and I found other uh, editor, you know, the editors at Duke said, you know, we have guidelines for proposals, but the fact of the matter is we want to see manuscripts. You know, we really don't want to talk to you about a book until you've basically written it. You know, we can talk about revising it, but, but, you know, telling us that you think it's going to be like this, you know, isn't very useful to us. And I had no idea and I didn't know that was even possible. So, 
Um, so that changed a lot. And I, um, the first time I had a conversation with the editor in chief at Duke University Press, um, I really, I hadn't finished the manuscript and I, some things about my project were still fuzzy in my mind. And it was a disastrous conversation. I could tell he was annoyed that I was even speaking to him, you know. Um, but so I went back and I just did the work and I finished the thing. And then when I spoke to another acquisitions editor um, and I could actually speak much more cogently and fluently about my project, it was, it was much easier to convince her that, you know, that this was worthwhile. And so at the end, she still said, you know, until it's as polished as you think it is, you know, that's the only thing I really want to see. Um, you know, and then, you know, she actually went through a process with her where she read it and suggested revisions and we worked together before we even sent it out to reviewers. Um, so the point is, I think that there are many different processes at these different presses um, and you can't possibly know how they like to work until you find a way to interact with them. Um, and in, if you're in the audience and you're thinking, how could I possibly, you know, find a way to make these connections? Um, yeah. I, for one, would be willing to um, help someone try to make such connections. And I think you should try to reach out to, to senior scholars, people who are more advanced to you and, and ask the questions, you know, how did you, how did you meet your editor? You know, what happened? You know, is there any way we can make contact? Um, I, some editors, again, won't like that. They'll say, no, no, just send the proposal through the proper channel and, you know, we'll look at it when we get it. Um, but like I said, it's hard to know the difference between the way these different presses work until you at least try to engage them, you know. Well, thank Thanks. you for, for that uh, insightful uh, response. Please, I'm seeing some questions already in the chat. Please keep those questions coming, those uh, comments and questions coming, please. Uh, Dr. Yeku, please. Thanks, bro. I'll just say in my experience, it was necessary to do some kind of retraining in terms of how to actually transition from the dissertation stage to the book. There's this very important book, I think by William Germano, from, from dissertation to book. It's a popular book out of University of Chicago Press, always recommended by many acquisitions editor, especially to to fresh PhDs, go read that book because they expect that, and I think the book actually does cover a lot. One of my colleagues, I, I think, Doton over at Northwestern said to me, James, you need to go read this book also. So I found that book really useful. But this was way, way into the pandemic, right? Because my book is a product of the pandemic. I got it accepted during the pandemic and every conversation I had was during the pandemic. When many editors were saying, give us six months, give us four months. And again, because of the accelerated nature of, my, of the materials and medium I was working with, I thought I didn't have a luxury of time. But just to, to, to circle back a little, fresh out of grad school, 2018, like author, you know, excited about defending the work. I, I sent the, 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 what I thought was a revised version of the dissertation to some series and they rejected it outright. You know, and that could have basically been the end of the show for me. Like Dr. Wanfo said, it, it did something to my sense of esteem. I, I thought I had done something fantastic and here was this series saying it was all crap. Again, just understanding the subjectivity of the process, how subjective the, the, the peer review process is, that was the first time it dawned on me. Having said that, I had always wanted to publish with African expressive cultures at Indiana University Press. So I, I, I knew what I wanted. So that's something I would really you know, suggest very strongly. It's always good to know what series out there, what university actually does, what you want to do, you know, to have a specific location in mind and to go for it. So when I spoke with the former editor, we retired some, I think, I mean, again, during, just before the pandemic, the Martins and she, she told me, James, you, you need to do so, you need to, to get the work done, you need to revise the dissertation and this and this and that. And because she had to leave, that affected the process of getting the, the work at Indiana. So I had to go to other presses. And anyway, for me, what I've learned through it all is just the, the, the necessity of being tenacious, being determined, you know. 
it's your book, you know the content more than even this peer, you know, this this readers and why their their contributions and insight could be invaluable. It's, it's still your material. And the conversation and air students you have should be an opportunity for some kind of cross-fertilization of ideas. The peer review process for me was a kind of necessary conversation. They they offered a lot of ideas that eventually shaped the book. I talked about the kindness of the the the, the of one of the readers. And I thought some of the pointers he gave me in his report really helped the material ultimately. This was somebody who wasn't writing on social media, was writing on Nollywood and, and media, but, but he had a lot to say because I deal with Nollywood in the book. So just you know, understanding the, the review process as, as a critical conversation and dialogue you enter into would really help. And I say that because the rejections will come. And sometimes I think the rejections should come to shape your work. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you have to be rejected at all. And I'm saying sometimes the rejection comes and it's part of the process. It helps the book to, to you know, to become what it will eventually become. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Yeku. Uh, we have an anonymous uh, note here directed to you, Dr. Yeku actually says, could you please type the name of the author of the book you recommended in the chat, uh, the, the one you talked about. So I if you could so. do that, that would be great, yes. Um, so, um, you know, it, it seems to me that what's, uh, one thing that is emerging here is that there's a wrong way to pitch the book and there's a right way to pitch it. It's the same book, it's the same material, nothing has changed, the arguments are still the same, but you know, if you pitch it in the wrong way to the wrong editor at a particular time, you could get a negative response. And if you pitch it uh, to the right editor um, in the right way at the right time, you get a different response. So it really has nothing to do with the quality of the work. Um, my, my own experience with this is still uh, fresh in my mind because uh, like everyone on this panel, I for my first book, I got a uh, couple of rejections. And, um, and then I had a conversation with a senior colleague at the time. It was a casual coffee conversation. And I was telling him about my experience. And he casually mentioned, he said, you know, have you thought about, and he was very familiar with my project. So he said, have you thought about pitching it this way? And until that moment, I hadn't even thought about doing that. I had a book proposal that I was tweaking here and there to send to different publishers. But I hadn't thought about, you know, essentially reframing the, the core of the project to, to make a different argument, to, to highlight what for him and, and for me now was the main point of this work. I, was, I buried it essentially. And because of that, I think I was getting the wrong responses. And as soon as I made that change, so I, you know, I, I put that front and center, that contribution. This is what I'm, you know, the, the I got I got positive responses. So pitching uh, it the right way and the wrong way uh, it can make the difference. See, I want to I want us to dis demystify this process further, right? So this I'm not uh, sending this question to everyone on the panel. I'll just throw it out. I think I need a couple of people to jump on it and respond. So let's let's break it down because we have we have, we have questions already and comments. We have an audience that's eager to know more about this process, how it actually works. So let's break it down to uh, you. Ha you have to have a proposal, right? A proposal. What goes into the proposal uh, specifically? What how you know what goes into the what makes it into the proposal? What doesn't? And how do you send it? Do you send it uh, like a cold email? Do you get an introduction? Is there a multi-step process? Let's, let's break it down to its uh, basic element, if we could, for the benefit of our audience. And I need maybe two panelists to jump on this and just help us do that. So anyone can volunteer. Yeah, I'll I think go most... first. Okay. okay. I'm gonna please go, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, well, I think first, the one of the key things that I would think goes into the proposal is to, of course, sell the book. What exactly is this book about? And to state it as quickly as possible. You know, one of the things I learned was that if you have to pitch a book, don't meamble. I mean, it's to an editor, right? And so if you're not writing the whole book yet, you have to say, this is the strength of the book. This is the argument that it makes 
that you have not seen before. This is the life, the world changing thing, uh, quality that this book contains and to say it as expressly and as quickly as possible. And also, you know, some of them send you forms that you can fill that you, they give you specific questions. So you are not um, all over the place. And they will ask you what exactly stands this book out? Why would anyone want to buy this book? And as much as possible, please, you know, work on that kind of question because it goes straight to marketing. Even if you have good material, even if you have written the very good pieces, very good argument, if it's not going to translate into sales, it's going to be very difficult for others, you know. And if you publish the aspect of your work and it has, you know, attracted some attention, you want to highlight it that you are not an entirely new um, person. This is not entirely new. People have already shown interest in some of your research or in some of your writings. And so you want to highlight all your strengths and what makes you a standout. And also, you know, present the way you present yourself, those aspects are very, um, very important. Do you cold email it? I would say yes, I try. I mean, there is no one way to the market in this kind of um, affair. If possible, you, for me, I look through websites of different places I want to publish it, look at the names of the acquisition editor, and then wrote to them. Some responded, some said, it's a good idea, but they are not, you know, at this time, they are not working on any book or they've moved on from some aspect of publishing. And some said they are leaving the publishing houses, which means that they cannot, you know, follow the process through. And so you look elsewhere. Some never even answered at all, which is worse than rejection, silence, you know. But all of that, like Jane said, is part of the process. So push it out. If they are going to, I mean, send out emails, look for books that have been published in those series, you know, look at the kind of things that they publish and then write proposal towards specific series. Yeah. Any additions? Uh, I think James, uh, Dr. Yuki, you were going to say something. So. I was just going to say that this thing is basically system specific, right? Different presses want different things in the proposal, but there are some general things I've seen, or I mean, that I think are common. What's the audience of the book? To whom is this book addressed? You need to be very clear about those who will find the book most useful. And then what contributions does this book make to the field? How is it different from say the book by somebody else? I'm currently, reading a book for a press and that question came up. Shola Dineko has a book, I have a book and then somebody else has written a book and they want to know, I hope I'm not giving out too much information. They want to know what's, you know, what's the contribution of this new book. Again, this is a digital culture, things are moving so fast and this person claims to be making this specific argument and contribution, but how is it different from these two, three other books in the field? So you have to be clear about what is the main argument of the book itself. And then I think at the proposal stage, it's important you have some kind of sample chapter. At that level, you want to probably put your best, your best sample chapter you know, forward. You don't want to put out something an editor would pick and would say, this reads like a dissertation, right? And I think that the anxiety to publish and the, you know, the zeal to quickly get a book out there might be one reason why you don't want to sit down to actually get that book from, from that manuscript from dissertation to a book shape, right? You still have a lot of, you know, argumentative structure that suggests you're trying to defend your point. You're still, you know, quoting the scholars. Whereas the book wants you to sound like the authority figure in the field, to author something, you know, have, perform some kind of authority, like you are confident in your assertions, you are very, you know, clear about the arguments you're making. So they want a, a sample chapter. Sometimes it might be an introductory chapter, especially if the book is complete. But if the book is not, if, if the book is still on, just make sure you send something that really articulates your best, you know, your best argument. And then of course, what's, what the organization, the style of the book, that's probably much later. But I, I guess those three things would be, would, would be it for me, the audience, the con specific contributions of the field and the main, argument and of course the sample chapter okay well thank you for those uh, responses i'm going to ask uh what i i think i'm going to combine these two questions together which will be the final round of questions 
before we turn it over to the audience, because I see that there are plenty of questions already um, that we, we need to address. So uh, what would you do differently, right? In terms of strategy, pitching, revisions, framing, uh, if you were to, you know, do it all over again today, now that, you know, would, you, would it be the same book? Would the book be different? And uh, finally, what advice do you have for a prospective first uh, book authors? So I know it's a loaded question. Uh, I can repeat some of these elements if you want, but uh, did we get that? I think we've got all the different aspects of this question. Okay. Uh, we'll start uh, in our normal order with Dr. Adelakun. Thank you, Prof. I mean, <laughs> my life is a load of things I would do differently. So this is no different. But I look back now and I realize that I could, you know, there are several other arguments that I could have included, which of course means that I would have written a different book. But um, I think I, I've come across some um, other kind of um, chapters I could have said, you know, I could have added this or that discussion and part of which, anyway, they are not lost because they went into another project. So it wasn't, yeah, but it helped. I saw that there are some ideas that I could have, you know, expanded on properly. And also because I closed the work during the time the pandemic was happening, I found that my conclusion was rather rushed because I, I was overwhelmed with everything at that time. And so the way I redid the things that I felt I left too open was to push it into another project. So that one. And um, for advice, I will say one thing that I learned along the way is that you don't have to walk alone. You don't have to do things alone by yourself. I think um, talk to people, use your friends to you know, ask them to help you read chapters. Of course, you have to reciprocate that kind of favor, but ask people to read for you ask people to engage people in conversations. Conversations are very important. It's no longer a dissertation, it's now a book, and you are going to be engaging a wide you know, audience. And so you want to test out some of your thoughts by arguing with people that are better than you are. You know, It's a discussion. You will learn a lot, you understand why your convictions are right or wrong, and the weak points, it's very enlightening. In my own case, I had a lot of discussion with Dr. Wariboko. Sometimes I throw out ideas and he brings in a lot of historical perspective that helps me to reframe my thinking along an issue. And I'm always very grateful for all those conversations, those extended conversations that I look back and I realize it was a lot of you know, privilege that you were talking to somebody who is very well known in the field, helping me. And so I would always say to people, well, whether you are writing or you are conserving ideas, Talk to people, you know, walk with people. You don't have to do it alone. Nobody writes a book entirely by themselves. It's always about a community helping you. So that is what I think for others. All right, thank you, Dr. Adela. Uh, Dr. Mwafa, please. The same set of uh, questions. Okay, um, I think um, my own um, experience wouldn't deviate uh, very much from uh, Dr. Adela Kuhn because um, personally, I would want to write a second book on Ashebi, and that is something that um, I discovered towards, you know, the end, um, at, at the time I was trying to wrap up my, my book, that um, I need to do something about Ashebi in the diaspora, and um, I discovered that um, I cannot actually write everything at the same time. So I, I, I decided it's possible that someone can actually do um, another work on um, Ashebi in, in the diaspora. That's a fourth. And, and secondly, um, it's, it's also, as um, Dr. Adelakun said, you have to seek out the advice of senior colleagues. And this time around, I have to say that um, senior colleagues, yes, but also junior colleagues, because I literally had to send my chapters to, to my own students, undergraduate students, asking them to read this chapter and let me know whether this um, is just making any sense at all to you. So in that way, you would 
understand whether uh, what you wrote, which initially was for specialized audience, um, can actually be acceptable, in, you know, within that um, popular readership uh, circle. So that's basically something that I'm, I would want to do um, again. So for now, let me leave it at that. Um, thank you, Moses. Uh, Dr. Arja, any other book, please? Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think like uh, Bimbola said, the projects, if I think about it now, will be completely different. You know, even the very language of, of writing it, I think I would have preferred to do something closer to creative nonfiction kind of book <laughs> rather than the academy's um, languages. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of things would have changed. But the reason I can say that now is because the book is there, right? So again, that structure of reference that allows me to rethink so many things and push myself beyond what I was hoping to get out of. Um, yeah, but the way I, I, I did the dissertation um, was also interesting. I walked, I couldn't do long stuff together, you know, like walk from one chapter into another. I had to think of each chapter as a standalone walk on its own right and then did the different chapters and then struggled to bring them together in, in in some way as and i think james read one of my chapters anyway and his insights were um very helpful um in the process so when i was thinking about the book it was the same thing i saw them as scattered fragments of something that was still vague in my, my mind that I had to give some kind of organic um, structure and bring together somewhat and um, that which was exactly what happened so the second part of the book um, the first part of the book was an attempt to bring that <laughs> into the um, the structure of the whole project but yeah, uh, the advice, I think they are, they are rather on, on the technical side, or ideological side as well. Um, first is, why do I want to do this book? And, and why, why should I publish a book? Um, secondly, why, who, who, who do I want to read this book? You know, who are my major targets for, for reading this book? I think I was in a workshop uh, 2019 that Moses gave at uh, LSA. Um, in person, you know, when life was in person. <laughs> he was talking about, um, um, you know, negotiating um, a way for your book to be made accessible to, say, Nigerian or African audiences as against having books published and they are located um, here and all that. So, so yeah, I, I wanted that, but because, again, different structures and different um, things I couldn't do, it was difficult. Eventually it worked out and the book was made an open access. So one advice is think of um, publishers that would be willing to sell your book where you want um, the kinds of readers you are looking for to, to have access to the book. And so, so that's one. Secondly is, you know, um, if that book comes out, to what extent will it break you? Like the bad aspect of it, I, 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 it, it can make you very vulnerable, right? Um, so if, if you feel that this book, you don't have confidence in it <laughs> when it comes out, don't publish it. I have shared it with, with so many other folks um, and, and be very courageous, like uh, Ukechuku, I think mentioned earlier in terms of what this project um, you are hoping to accomplish with it. But I, I usually run that vulnerability test with myself. If this project comes out, again, my work was a bit sensitive. So, and I understand the challenges I encountered in the process, people feeling, but this is not genocide. There was no genocide in Nigeria. You are biased, you know, <laughs> and all of that. So I, I needed to run that. If this comes out and I got everything all wrong, um, yeah, so... Can you deal with that? <laughs> Once I realized, yeah, I don't care, I can deal with it. I was okay to run with the project, right? So I, I needed to be sure that I'm not damaging myself by publishing, right? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anyaruba. Uh, Dr. Brown, please. Dr. Brown, um, I, um, thank you, Prof. I uh, would 
would first of all echo um, Professor Adela Kunz's um, advice about seeking readers and, and others who have said it. So just to say that one more time, I don't think I sought enough correspondence and collaboration with others along the way. I was a little worried that I was making arguments that might ruffle people's feathers. And so I just kind of preferred to, you know, tinker with them on my own. Um, and, and so I would definitely do that differently. Um, the other thing that, you know, the other thing about, you know, I said I started with a blank page for the book manuscript. In some sense, you know, the dissertation was one way of writing an archive. The book was another way of writing the same archive. I could see writing the same archive, you know, two or three other different ways, you know. So in some sense, you know, um, you know, I could do it differently. I could I could sit down with the same archive and write an entirely new book. And I think I would be just as excited about it as I am about the, the first two. Um, and all that, you know, points to the idea that, um, you know, at some point you just have to, to live with what it is at this moment. You know, you have to be willing to let the thing that you have go out into the world and, and feel comfortable with it. You can always improve it. You can always, as others have said, you know, oh, there's an additional argument I could have made or a different citation I could have brought into it or a different direction this has gone. But, um, but there are always other projects and you just have to live with some version of it to get it out into the world. And then finally, for me, one thing that I'm still struggling with is I chose the title from my book very early and I was very committed to it. And my editor really liked it, but I have never, I've encountered very, very few other people who like it at all. <laughs> so um, I feel, you know, I, it mystifies people, you know, and I think I was, I kind of wanted it to be that way. I wanted to frame it as a kind of a theoretical I, I'm a theory person, I really like theory, and, and I wanted to do a kind of theory book, and I wanted to frame it primarily as that, with Nollywood as the driving archive of these theoretical interventions. And so I chose a, a title that kind of foregrounded the theoretical concept and put the, you know, the archive after the colon. Um, and like I said, I chose that early, I had support on it, and so I felt like it was a, it was a good thing to do, and I'm not sure that I would change it exactly, uh, but it has created challenges, you know, everywhere I go, people are like, but I don't understand what could that book possibly be about. And you do want people to know what your book is about from the title. That, that is a good thing for a book to do. So it's something I think is just worth commenting on. Again, I'm not sure if I would change it, but it's an important thing to think about. As others have said, this is, marketing is part of this process. And your title has to sit on a shelf with other titles. It has to grab people's attention. It has to do a certain kind of work. And sometimes editors make you choose certain titles, you know, or they force you to, to tweak your titles in certain ways. You should probably listen to them. Um, but it's something that is not so difficult for a dissertation, but for a book is actually a very big choice you have to make. And, you know, it's something that, at least for me, I'll be second guessing maybe forever. Um, but, you know, for others, it's, it's if, you know, you should, you definitely have to conceptualize this, think ahead about it, think about how it's going to sit on that shelf with others and, you know, how that's going to pan out for you in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Dr. Yeku, please. Yes, I, I think I would change a number of things in terms of content also. It's, I mean, everybody has said that already, so I don't want to go there. I would I just go to something else. I'd apply to a center on my campus or money to do my indexing. And they gave me the money and I didn't acknowledge them in the book. So I, I thought I was really just messed up. I don't know how I forgot to do that. I didn't like that. And some other center- well, watch, that, watch out, they'll get you back. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the ironic thing is I had applied to another center and I, I thought those ones would give me the money. So I, I acknowledged those ones and didn't acknowledge the people who eventually gave me. The, so it's just all messed up. I wish I had avoided that kind of mistake. And then at the point I looked at my acknowledgement and I saw I left out some names. Otto for, for one, but I mean, Otto didn't read any part of my book, but when you have been in conversation with people over the years, the ideas you eventually get into a book kind of come from exchanges with you know, a whole community of people. So there's this in, in, invisible label that I believe goes into the production of the book. And I thought, I, I mean, I wish, had acknowledged more people just to say thank you. But I did manage to, to smuggle in Saeed Adiriton's name because when I was trying to get my book out, it was one of the first people I spoke with. 
and he told me this, this, this. They sent me, I mean, you know, Professor Adirato in his characteristic manner, sent names of editors and what have you. So I had no choice but to go to the to the publisher to say I have to you know include some last minute names and East was there. So anyway, my acknowledgement and you know those kind of technical issues, those are the kind of very minor regret I have. But in terms of content, I, I believe that there's so much to to change. But hopefully a, a second book down the line might address those kind of things. African digital humanities for one. I wanted to, to name my final chapter African DH to signal my next direction. But somehow I, I, I didn't get to do that. I only touched on African DH briefly. I, I wish I had called my last chapter African Digital Humanities to, to I mean, just to begin to anticipate my next project. Okay. I'm not necessarily giving out the content of my next project. I may not even do that, but at least <laughs> just to okay. get people guessing. All right. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to go. Thank you, Dr. Yeku. I've been told that we have about 15 minutes to go. I thought we had more, but anyway. Let's get into the questions. Uh, first question, anybody can just uh, tackle this as briefly as you can. Uh, from our colleague and friend, Dr. Ademide Adeliti Adeli. Uh, thank you for your insights. How did you know when you were done with the final version of the book? In other words, how did you learn to let go and say, okay, that's it, I'm, you know, so that, you know, when, when did you, how did you let to let go? Anybody, anybody, please. Uh, the questions are here. Anyone? Oh, um, for me, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was so, when- so Go on, the, go on. Yeah, okay. It was when the deadline approached. I am the kind of person that if you give me another one year, I'll still be editing. So it's always best to give the deadlines and I'll work towards it. I always look for that thing, you know, there's always that fear that I will have left something out. And eventually I find that I leave, I, something has been left out. And that's also part of the process. No single book can contain everything. So there's always that point you feel like you can't add anything anymore. It has to go. And of deadlines, strict deadlines help. Okay. Any, any response to that for the next one? Okay. All right, let's keep it moving. You know, my undergraduate advisor told me when I was doing my uh, undergraduate thesis, he said, you know, if you bring this uh, thesis back to me 20 more times, I'll have more corrections and you'll have more comments to give you. So at some point, you better just decide, look, I'm done with this stuff and let's move. So there's a question here. For, for some of us whose dissertation is mainly empirical and the use of statistical techniques, we do have few conceptual and analytical reviews but with large statistical analysis. How do we do a book from that kind of thesis as a first time writer? Anybody can take a stab at this. So a uh, dissertation that is mainly very statistically driven, very empirical, not a whole lot of the type of conceptual and theoretical framing that we've been talking about. How do they, pitch it, turn it into a book manuscript that they can pitch, that is pitchable to a press? I think there's always uh, a university press out there, a book series out there for any book anyone has written. The methodology should not be something that restricts anyone. Okay. As long as this book has an overarching argument that details a specific contribution, some acquisitions editor would be interested in it, right? And the issue of, I mean, I, I think there's, there's a space for your book out there, that's my answer. As long as you know how to take on bottom of the points people have mentioned, I mean, Abimbola, author, very important ideas mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, having your, your ideas out there, selling your work to an acquisitions editor who sees the value of the work. Methodology should be the last, I mean, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, it doesn't really matter. I, I do so, I, I mean, I do a bit of work with quantitative data because of DH, and I know that it's sometimes difficult to sell those kind of, you know, methodological approaches in, in the humanities, but sometimes you show the relevance of this. I'm trying to do a statistical analysis of, say, proverbs and things for that pattern. I'm using a stylometric software. 
if I want to pitch a book on that to say Duke, I would have to justify why that, why that kind of method is important. But that's just a method I also make an argument. The argument is the focus, I think. Yeah. And that's a great point, uh, Dr. Yoku. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think the, the way I like to complement what you said is that even statistics, even numbers and quantitative data, it's, it's a form of discourse as well. That's why we, we, we call them statistical discourses for a reason, right? Uh, so anyway, there's another question here. What are the main areas in a dissertation that require revisions into a book? To ask differently, what areas specifically in your dissertation did you have to revise? Number two question, what are your thoughts on publishing with non-university presses, but still scholarly uh, presses such as Lexington books? Oh, it's a loaded question. There's a third part of this one. Wow. What kind of questions would you advise? Uh, okay. What kind of questions would you advise someone scheduled to meet with an acquisition uh, editor to ask? So three questions. I hope someone somewhere got <laughs> uh, some aspect of the question. Feel free to tackle any of these uh, three um, aspects. Okay, um, can I just uh, quickly say something? Yes. Um, okay. Let me. I'm not. I'm not going to take it. You know. You know. From that uh, point of view, that the question uh, was addressed. But I just want to perhaps go to the nitty gritty of. Um, turning your dissertation into a book. And I, I have to be very brief here. Um, when I, I was struggling with turning my dissertation into a book, I got in touch with a senior colleague um, at Northwestern University. And um, I, I said to her, I, I don't really know how to do this. And she said to me, do you know how to write a book? I said, no, I will, I will teach you how to write a book in just a sentence. And um, I said, what? She said, can you write a story? I said, yes, I can write a story. She said, okay, that's just how you can write a book. You see, go straight to your dissertation, all those long quotations, citations, all those authors that you've been citing, just you can do away with all of them and then go back to your field work get your uh, field notes and then tell us a story in your book. And I think that literally solved my entire problem. So assuming we have more time, I would have just taken it in detail to, to read just um, the first paragraph, a first sentence or two sentences of my dissertation, a chapter, and then the, the, the first two sentences of my book to see how both of them um, differ in terms of writing a book and writing a dissertation. But literally, sim very, in a very simplistic um, manner, how to write a book is just to tell us a story, a story that um, uh, everyone who is not in your, in your specialized discipline can read and connect to it and understand. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. I, I can jump in yes, um, just to say, and, and I agree with Okechukwu about making a book into a narrative, you know, that the book tells in itself. But also just understand we are dealing with academic books. They are not necessarily supposed to be open to any readership, I, I think. You know, it could be specialist oriented. Your work could be entirely theoretically based and you are speaking to a specialist audience. Again, it means there's a press interested specifically in that kind of work, right? Because academic kinds of, these are research works. We are not necessarily trying to pitch the work to a larger market. Sometimes your core audience is a group of scholars like you who understand what you are dealing with. Um, so, so to the question of scholarly presses that are not necessarily university presses, um, and someone, I think one of the first questions is about predatory uh, presses, especially Lambert Academic Publishing. Just avoid those guys. Um, they are criminals. They will steal your manuscript and get you to sign um, sign off on, on your work, right? So, so avoid predatory uh, presses. Look up, you know, uh, websites where you have all those uh, kinds of presses listed. But there are a couple of reputable ones like Lexington or Palgrave Macmillan and, and so on. 
um, I, because this is first book and I know part of what I needed it for was promotion, I wanted to work with university presses, right? So instead of um, non-university academic uh, presses for, for a reason, um, but also many of those kinds of presses may push you to open your language up if your work is theoretically dense uh, or full of academies, you know, such presses generally would because uh, I have a friend who published with Lexington and it's part of what they worked in through to open the language up for wider accessibility and so on. So maybe that's one of the benefits. Some university presses work with core scholars in the field in you know, that would, some of them wouldn't necessarily mind. But yeah, working through dissertation where you're quoting and you're speaking to your committee, I think the book would have a more open, accessible language than, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, let me stop here and someone else can answer the last question. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to jump in because ironically, I was sitting around a table with, uh, with Saheed uh, last night here and he was really passionate about this subject. Um, and so in some sense, I'm just going to try and, um, you know, um, translate what he was saying. Uh, you know, one of the important things here about when it comes to which kind of press you choose, you, you know, to go with is to think long term about your career. Um, you know, for some of us, if you're at an R1 institution or similar, uh, they won't even accept for a, a tenure or promotion uh, portfolio, uh, a book that's not published at uh, an, a university press. You know, so right there, that's you thinking about, you know, your career and moving forward and you're forced to do it. Um, in some other universities, they may not pressure you that much to think about those kinds of things. But, um, you know, the question might be, do you want to stay at that university, you know, long term? Do you want to think about different options you might have in the future and so on? So, um, and of course, different people will have different ideas about this. Actually, I'm very happy at my institution. This is a great opportunity for me. This is why I want to publish. But maybe I want to go on the job market in a few years. And maybe having a book that's published by an academic, by a university press will be useful for me. Um, uh, the, the, the big takeaway, I think, is, um, you know, is are you thinking long term or are you just thinking about this book? You know, and that's the big question is, um, you know, it might be exciting to just get a book published and, um, and that's what you're thinking about at this moment. Uh, but there are ways that you can be a mover in the field and push things forward and you don't know what will come, you know, down the line and you can position yourself more strategically by, you know, thinking about what kind of press that you publish with. Um, and this is not at all, I don't, you know, there's an elitism, you know, to sort of, you know, holding certain um, presses over other ones and so on, but we have to be strategic and clear about sort of the politics of the way the profession works. Um, and depending on your future goals, the kind of press you publish with will have an effect, you know, on, on the way that your career plays out, you know, so just think long term about it, you know, and what do you want, you know, more than just this book, what do you think you want to get out of things in the future, and that may determine what kind of press you look at. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to try to combine the, the first part of this uh, question that I don't think we've addressed with another question from Ututi Fong Inyang. And this one is from Catherine Odari. So the specific aspects of the dissertation that require revisions into a book, the intro, the conclusion, which, which uh, and then the other question says, could the panelists speak to the process of compressing or expanding the scope of their book from the specific focus of their dissertations. So I think those are related questions. Anyone? I think just to um, very briefly speak to this, like, like Matt, I had to almost start from scratch with my book. Maybe the dissertation itself constitutes just about 40% of the book, right? Because I had to basically just rewrite a lot of things and so I did that because Yuti's question is getting us to think about what should go in and what should stay out. And I think it's a very important question. At some point, we'll have to decide if this argument could be made somewhere else. Is this material fit for a journal article or is this material fit for this book? So the ability to be able to distinguish between which goes into what you know, publication 
is really important. So for me, it was it was necessary to cut some materials and just start all over again, right? For Matt, it was probably a different experience, like you said. Well, thank you. Uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah. go ahead. Yes. I want to quickly add that you might need to expand your data collection if you've done some ethnographic research. And by the time you're out of you know, grad school and you find a, a little distance from the work and then you look back, you might find that some content are insufficient. And so you might need to expand on data collection. And in doing that, you will necessarily have to revise the theories, the concepts, the ways you, the framing of the work in itself, because more uh, materials coming in will definitely reshape your work. And I should quickly also add one more thing is that um, in revising, sometimes give yourself six months to one year out of grad school, you know, to achieve some kind of critical distance that might help you to, you know, stand and evaluate the work from a different perspective. By the time you are out of it, you are, you know, you've been working at it for like five, six, seven years depends on how long the project took. And now that you are out, you know, moving out of it, stay away from it for a while. And, you know, before going back to it from a different perspective, it helps a lot. We've come to the end of our time. Thank you very much uh, for a wonderful conversation. If you need to contact any of the panelists, you know how to get to them. It's been wonderful. Have a great night or have a great evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.